some O-line guys on tonight. Uh, we, we got quite an array of guys from, from some different areas and uh, some different, um, you know, levels of, of football here. So uh, I'm going to kind of let them introduce themselves. So uh, we'll kind of go around the horn. And, and if you could just start with, you know, just uh, just a brief, you know, wh where you came from and maybe who your biggest influence has been in the O-line, that, that would be awesome. So we'll, we'll, I'll start off with Skip in my top left-hand corner. Okay. Defensive coordinator at Portland High School. Uh, played at Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Plymouth State, um, first coaching job was in Dover. Uh, college job was back at my alma mater, Plymouth State. Then went to Southwest Missouri. Uh, had kind of a tragedy, had to come home. My dad passed away. Um, worked at Winter County High School as an offensive line coach and uh, defensive line coach for three years. And then took the job at Lewiston, was there for 14 as a head coach. I had an opportunity, fortunate enough, to win a state championship and coach some pretty good players. Um, from there, I had an opportunity to go to Bates, uh, as, originally as the offensive line coach for four, moved over to the defensive line, and also was a special teams coordinator uh, for a number of years. And then my last three years, I coached the offensive line. And for two of those years, I was the offensive <laughs> coordinator. And then a year or so ago, I left Bates. And I'm in Portland, having a blast. My biggest influence was my high school coach, uh, Tom Dobney. He actually ironically came back and coached at Noble seven or eight years ago when they were in a pinch. And my, my college coach, um, Tom Bell, also, but obviously my dad and mom were one of my biggest influences, encouraged me to go into coaching, something like, that I had a passion for. I've uh, been around great people. Every, every stop I've been, a lot, of, a lot of older guys took me under their wing, thought I had something to offer, and I've been trying to do the same thing um, for the 40, this will be year 45 for me. Coach Johnson? Uh, guys, I'm Bobby Johnson. I'm from uh, Leicester, Massachusetts. There's a little town right next to Worcester. Um, I'm going on year nine. I uh, did the world tour as a player, and I've done the world tour as a coach. Um, went to Milford Academy, upstate New York, and then played for Coach uh, Tom Godek for a year at Southern Connecticut. He's my biggest influence. Um, he still texts me once a month. Um, probably the best line coach I ever, I ever played for, one of the best line coaches I've ever been around. Um, I, when I first started coaching, I didn't want to be a coach. Um, I played at Worcester, I graduated from Worcester State, played my last two years there, um, and played for Brian Cullen, who'd been there for 35 years. And, um, he said, Hey, Bobby, why don't you just come do spring ball with us? Um, my last, my last semester of school, I was 25 years old and, uh, I fell in love with it and I've been doing it ever since. I coached down in Oregon at Willamette University, I've coached at Curry College in Boston. My first job was at Plymouth State. I worked at Bridgeton for a year. I loved, I loved that up there in Bridgeton. Um, I was at AIC for a year, um, and then I was at RPI. Worked with a bunch of great dudes at RPI the last couple of years, and I got hired at Albany as the assistant line coach in uh, February. Um, but, yeah, my biggest influence to be, being a coach, um, uh, Coach Godek, and then uh, Mike Cavanaugh at Syracuse. Uh, I got to know him through one of my mentors, and uh, he's been really good to me. Awesome. Coach Ledoux? So, yeah, Ben Ledoux, uh, grew up in Buxton, Maine, played at Bonnie Eagle under Kevin Cooper, uh, played a little bit of linebacker at Bowdoin, um, then came back, started coaching at Bonnie Eagle. This would be my 16th year this fall. Um, I've been coaching online by myself uh, since John Suddy left, right at the turn of 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. Um, I'd say that in addition to Coop, my two big influences coaching are Eric Klein, who was my position coach as a tight end and linebacker in high school. And then John Suddy, who I coached with for uh, seven years as an offensive line assistant. Awesome. Coach Wells. Yeah. Um, JB Wells. I'm, I'm currently the head football coach at uh, the Kingswood Oxford school, which is an independent school in West Hartford, Connecticut. Um, I have been, I've been all over. I grew up in Connecticut and I attended uh, Trinity College and played for the great Don Miller, um, who is overarchingly the, the, the biggest influence in my life because he's the one that kind of really encouraged me to get into coaching. Um, you know, he'd say all the NESCAC guys, they got a problem there. Their buddies all make so much money and then the ones that go into coaching want to go make money, so they stop coaching. Um, but he said I, I didn't want to make money and I think he was wrong. I think he just didn't want to pay me very much. Um, but Don, Don was a big influence. I, I graduated from there. I went to Brown University for a year, uh, two years back at Trinity as a GA. Then I went up, I coached at, I coached at Bates. 
uh, for a couple of years. And um, that's where I got to know Skip when he was coaching at Lewiston High. Uh, left there and went uh, to the University of Chicago for a couple of years. Um, was out of Chicago, came back to Trinity for a year, went back out to Illinois, to Illinois Wesleyan. Uh, really good program out there. Uh, was there for three, and then I got an opportunity to start the football program at Endicott College. Uh, so we got that up and running and got pretty good. And was there for 13, and then uh, I got an offer to come up and coach at Bowdoin. And, uh, you know, being an NESCAT guy, you know, that, that, that kind of spoke to me. So I went up to Bowdoin for four years, and uh, now I find myself back in my home state at, uh, at KO. I've been, a, I've been a line guy every year that I, that I could be. You know, there were some years where – um, I got one year I got talked into coaching running backs and that was a big mistake. Um, uh, so I, I got rid of the line guy and I went back to coaching the line. And then, um, you know, I've coached quarterbacks and offensive line my whole career. So, uh, you know, it's great to be here. It's, it's, the, it's the most fun position to coach and it's the best one to talk about because it's, it's got the most skill involved. So looking forward to tonight. Thanks. Awesome. Coach Bach? Yeah. <clears throat> my name is Dave Bockler. I grew up in South Florida. Uh, back in the 80s, played against uh, Michael Irvin, the Hesters, that kind of football down south. Uh, I went to Maine, uh, played uh, guard for Ron Rogerson in the wing tee, uh, then switched over and played defense. I was a nose guard there. Uh, Murphy was there. Tevens became the head coach. Uh, when I was going to go for my fifth year because I was redshirt, uh, Skip called me somehow got my number up there and asked me to come to Lewiston and, and coach with him. I didn't know this guy from anybody. So I said, no, I'm going back to my fifth year. Well, lo and behold, when I got done with my fifth year, I worked in uh, Boston for a year and then moved back to Lewiston. And somehow some guy got my phone number in Lewiston and asked me to come work with him. And uh, that was in 87 when he called and I started coaching with Skip in 88. Uh, I was the assistant line coach for a year uh, with Teddy Moshe. Uh, Teddy moved on to Oxford Hills. I stayed with Kip, Skip. I was the O-line and D-line coach uh, for Skip for six years. Uh, and uh, we had some good teams then. Uh, when I went there, I was sort of the, you know, the heavy, you know. And then Darren Hartley showed up to be my assistant line coach, and I knew I could no longer have that role. Um, I've been coaching since 1988. Uh, I've I put five linemen in D1 programs. Uh, three of them at Maine. Um, been having a ball, never wanted to be anything but an, a line coach, and that's all I've ever done. I've been with Mike uh, Hathaway since uh, 2002. Um, seen some, you know, some change in our game over the last 15, 20 years. So this is, I guess, going to be our 18th or 19th year together uh, with Mike Hathaway as his line coach. Awesome. Thanks, Coach. Uh, coach Danke? Hey, guys. Uh, Pat Denneke, assistant head coach and run game coordinator at University of Maine. Uh, originally from Buffalo, New York. Uh, grew up there. Uh, went to St. Francis High School. Played for Jerry Smith, who's uh, still one of my biggest influences. He's been there about 30 years now. Sent countless guys to college. I think the total number is over 200 players he sent to play college ball. Uh, played at Washington Jefferson College. We had a pretty good run while I was there down in Pennsylvania, made it to the playoffs all four years. Um, played for Coach Sirianni, uh, another extremely successful coach. I think uh, has is in top 10 winning percentage for any coach in uh, NCAA football, regardless of division. Uh, he's been there about 20 years now. Um, again, still someone I talked to. And then uh, graduated from WNJ in 2010. Uh, first job was down at Bethany College in West Virginia. Uh, very thankful to Tim Weaver, who I think some of you guys know. He was at Delaware for a few years and now is at Brown, is at BC. He was the head coach, gave him my first job. Uh, from there, I GA'd out at the University of Nevada for, uh, for three seasons. Uh, did two years on D, which is a great learning experience for me, and then was able to kick back to the offensive line my last year. Played in a couple bowl games and uh, was around a great coaching staff. Uh, Brian Bowling was the head coach, who is now at Notre Dame. Uh, Nick Rolovich was our offensive coordinator, who's now at Washington State. And uh, Jim Hoffer was another one that was a big influence on me. He spent several years uh, in the CAA. And uh, after I finished up my degree, I was lucky enough to catch on with uh, University of Maine in 16 when Coach Harris Simiak got hired. Um, learned a lot from the, that initial staff. Uh, Brian Picucci was, probably taught me more football than anybody that have been around. You know, just really a, a 
extremely smart football coach. So I've been very lucky to be around a lot of great coaches. And um, like I said, I've been, been the offensive line coach at Maine since, 20, since 2018, the last two years, and uh, year five overall. Awesome, Coach. I'm going to start you guys off with um, just kind of a general uh, a general question about your position group. Uh, give me, you know, one or two of the, the top things that you do to uh, to build the culture within your uh, position group. So, Skip, we'll, we'll start with you and kind of keep moving the same way. Talk about five, five guys working together, five strong. Uh, we're all in it together. Uh, one guy, if one guy breaks down, it screws up the other four. So we all we all got to be helping each other. We all got to be working together, and that's a common denominator from day one. It's all about the guys up front. Pretty simple. Um, with us, it starts my first meeting. We'll have our veterans sit in the back. Um, we have our young guys up front, and I mean, it's it's so those those older guys can really you know bring along the young guys. They can see who's struggling, and they can ask questions. I mean, I don't need my 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 veterans up front in the meeting room. They already know what they're doing. I sit in the middle of the meeting room, and I, I'm, I'm close enough to the young guys, and I'm close enough to the, the older guys if anybody does have a question. But I think that the way we start our meetings, the way we, we are in our meeting, um, is it, it starts communication from day one, and the guys feel comfortable. Um, the last couple of years, I started three freshmen at RPI last year. The year before that, I started two freshmen. Um, and then this year at Albany, we're probably going to start a grad transfer and three sophomores or two freshmen. So, I mean, that uh, just to, like build that confidence, that communication from that for that day one in your meeting room. I think that's a huge thing. Coach Ledoux? Thank you, Alvin. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm uh, same way, just trying to develop communication lines. I let guys know right away. I'm going to coach them hard. I think the line is I'm an equal opportunity hater, and everybody's going to catch some. And I want everybody to be accountable to each other. And then – I want to be accountable to them too. So if I screw up, I'm just going to try to let them know, have some ownership on some things and let, let my guys lead as we go along and really try to let, let the players take control as we go. Coach Wells. Yeah. I, I, I think the offensive line is unique in the sense that I don't know how much culture building you really have to do in an offensive line room, you know, um, they're all generally the, the, you know, it's the last stop before the bus stop and, you know, they all know it. And uh, so I think going in there and, and, and showing them that, you know, they're, they're valuable athletes and that the things that they do are, are more skill related than maybe some of the guys catching touchdown passes or, or uh, you know, playing linebacker. Uh, you know, so I, I think it's almost building them up a little bit to understand that they're more athletic than they probably have ever been given credit for. And, uh, you know, I think if you do that as a coach – and you're really showing them that they're a valuable football player and not just a, a big slug that has to play O-line, um, you get a lot of buy-in. And because they look around and they, they see that they're all in the same boat, they tend to, they tend to bond together pretty quickly. You know, pizza and wings always, always enhances your culture in that room too. So don't be afraid to feed them because they'll, they'll come running. Thanks, Coach Bach. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> coaching high school, a little different than, you know, the college kids that have already understood that that's their role. Uh, you know, we get some young kids that have come up that might have, because of our spread offense, might have been a fullback, carry the ball. Well, guess what? You're now a guard. Uh, so there's some adjustment that we have to make with him. Uh, but we do try and build a culture when we are practicing and, you know, we're doing drills and working our ass off and backs are running patterns, you know, and, uh, I'll stop our drills and I'll say, stop. I want you all to stop and turn around and look, okay? Our job is to work harder than anybody on this field and we're gonna work harder than anybody on any field. And so understand that our role is to carry the weight. And I said, it's gonna make you a good husband, it's gonna make you a good father. You're not gonna get credit you deserve, but that's the role that we have taken on. So we'll stop practice many times and just turn around and just watch the backs. And the other thing that we do is that when we break all together uh, on our team, the linemen always go to the head of the line. I said, we're the male lions. You know, we eat first. And so it sort of gives that culture. And Mike's done a good job, you know, especially with, with Wyatt, you know, giving credit to the offensive line, giving credit to the offensive line, because the only time you're going to hear them is <clears throat> number 73. So we try and build them up a little bit. Um, that we are the big dogs, you know, they get the press because they need it type thing. 
Awesome. Pat? Yeah, for us, uh, I know it's a little different than some, for some of you guys at the high school level, but the most important thing we do is recruit. And if you're recruiting a kid that you don't think fits your culture already, then you're doing your team a disservice. So everything <laughs> for us starts there. Uh, we got to identify these guys early and make sure that they're about the right things and they're going to fit into the culture that you've already established. And then when they get here, it's for us, we're very detailed about what we expect from them. Um, if you don't tell them exactly what you want, then they're not going to be able to to execute that or live up to that standard. So if you're if you're ambiguous, if you're vague with your expectations, they're going to toe the line and they're not going to know where to fall in. Um, we try to be as detailed as possible to let them know what the expectations are. And and then if they don't reach those expectations, there's no gray area. Awesome, fellas. Uh, just start to get into some technique stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll go around the hall. We'll, we'll start with Pat this time and, and kind of work backwards. Uh, Two-point stance or three-point stance, which do you prefer and, and, and maybe the most important reason why you prefer that, if you have a preference? Uh, I think we actually talked about this in my clinic, too. Um, I don't have a preference. Um, I give my tackles, especially the freedom of being either. As long as I feel that they're not tipping anything, um, then I'm good with them being in a two-point or a three-point. Obviously, situationally, it's going to change. Third and long, we're going to be in two-point. Third and short, we're going to be in a three-point. Uh, our guards are primarily in a, in a three-point, um, but our center actually flipped to guard for a handful of games this, this year. And you know, because he's been a three-year starter, uh, because he was more comfortable in a two-point, uh, we let him play in that. And the best reasoning I've heard for giving him the, the option uh, I got from our offensive line coach in Nevada, uh, Ron Hudson. Um, he basically said, we, we've always, we don't get the best athletes sometimes. Uh, we, we get the, the try-hard guys, but they might have a little bit of stiffness to them. So if they're struggling to get down into a good three-point stance, then they're going to just waste motion and movement getting out of it. So if they're going to play at a certain pad level, let them start at that pad level if they can't physically do it. Uh, so everything we teach is about functional movement and ease of movement, being able to get, get in and out of their stance. So if they're hindering their movement, getting in a three-point stance, and we'll put them in a two-point. Yeah, I, I'm a two-point guy for a couple reasons. Uh, one is, you know, high school football kids, you know, you teach that chest to thigh type thing. And the first step every kid, all these high school kids tend to make is up. Their first step is up. And so what I figured is, if you're going there anyways, let's start there. Uh, the other thing it does is it, it helps shield a little bit about what's going on behind you for linebackers to see. And the other thing I did is I moved our hands. You know, we used to do that cock to your hips thing, go for your guns thing. And over clinics that I've been to and just experienced, I saw that that's sort of a, a retreat move going backwards. When you go back, he's coming forward. He's getting more into you. So we keep our hands high. We let them, you know, we try and tell them, you know, you want to stay low, but we get them up because that's where they're going to be anyways. It's very functional. Their hands are up. They start way up high. They don't start down here. Um, and our first move is, is out. So I'm, I'm a two-point guy for those couple reasons. Good and well, especially if you're going to be oops. pulling guys a lot, it's a lot easier to pull from a two than it is from a three. Coach Wells? Yeah, I'm probably along the lines with Pat. Um, guards generally, I, I, I've had them in twos and don't differentiate from that very much. Tackles have the, have the option um, uh, based, on, based on mobility, just because some of the pass protection type things are, are obviously easy, easily or easier out of a two. But I had the same thing happen, Pat. Our center um, you know, moved to guard. And he, he was just more comfortable in a two. And he was super functional from the two. So why, why mess with it? Um, so I'll do the same thing. I, I think you kind of find what they're what they're most comfortable being in, and if if they can move out of a out of a three point, some kids have great three point stances. Don't mess with it, I guess. Um, so I give them a you know it's a tool, you know it's a skill, just like any other skill is getting in and out of a stance. We will work with them on how to get into a good three point stance, or even how to get into a four point stance for for short yardage situations. So they have to learn that. But on a down-to-down -down basis, it's kind of up to them. But in general, the default is the tackles will generally be up and the guards will generally be down. Awesome. Coach Ledoux? Yeah, we're exclusively two-point uh, other, other than the snap. Um, so 
we've been in two point for a long time now. And I think that um, we've gone back and forth a little bit with this same discussion where I think it's, I think it's easier for us to coach run blocking out of a two than it is a pass set out of a three. And so to get a kid that has to go in and protect in the JV game, who, like we're saying, may not be a great athlete and our JV quarterback is probably going to be a pretty important player for us on special teams, or he's the next guy up if we're asking our tackle to get out of the three point and go block a seven shade or wide nine, whatever you want to call it. And that that's a kid that doesn't move very well. I like our chances protecting out of a two point better than out of a three. And I feel a lot better about coaching the run, run block out of a two point stance than getting some of those guys that are a little stiffer into a three point. Awesome. Coach Johnson. Uh, everything is predicated on down distance. I mean, personally, I'm a three point stance guy. I always will be, I play in the spread and I still pass block out of a three point, but, um, you know, it's predicated. Our tackles are most of the time going to be two point stance. Um, biggest thing too, though, um, when I'm teaching everything, we're doing each drill, whether it's drive block regression, whether it's, you know, sets, pass, <laughs> punches. we're doing one from the down, we're doing one from the up. So they're getting reps and doing, you know, everything out of a two point and a three point stance. And the guys can learn themselves, hey, I can pass that better out of a two. Hey, I can run block better actually out of, out of a two than a three. So every time I'm doing, we're doing drills, I'm making sure the guys are getting rep out of a three point stance and a two point stance. Skip. Oh, fellas, I'm going to show my age. I've been coaching a three-point stance uh, as an offensive line guy for, for 40 years. Uh, I am starting to come around a little bit, uh, debating this year after going through uh, what I went through. I went coaching in Portland a year ago, back at the high school level, wondering if maybe for our tackles we may be in a, in a, uh, in a, in a two-point stance this year. Still kind of going back and forth, but I still, I don't know, I guess – Part of me, it, brain-wise, I do like the fact the kids in the three-point stance, they, they're going to start a little bit lower, and that's kind of where I'm at. I'm, right now, I really I really like a three-point stance. And, again, I've always the run – the offenses that I have run or have, have, have been very run-oriented. You know, we do, we, we've never, never, I've never been a five-step drop guy. It's been quick pass. It's been play action. So, again, that, that's a little easier to, to, to teach or – not too difficult to teach out of a three-point stance. I guess maybe if I, I was in a situation where I was teaching more five-step drop, uh, vertical sets and things like that, probably out of a two. But uh, right now, I'm, I'm a, a three-point stance guy. Yeah, I, I'll just throw in from my point of view, just as a head coach, you know, running the spread. Coach Scott mentioned it today, and I know it was something that Daryl and I, uh, Daryl Weiss and I, when we both went to the spread and we're running a lot of, uh, like, Tony DeMeo-style triple out of it. Uh, if you're in a two, you can adjust your stance. Uh, if the defense moves, uh, and, you know, we, you're always trying to widen the read key or, or maybe widen the guy that you're going to trap a little bit or whatever. And, and that was always, you know, something I felt strongly about. Uh, Dave mentioned it hides the mesh a little bit. Um, but when the guys are in two, it's a little harder for the linebackers to see back there. But the, the biggest thing for me, I think, is pre-snap communication and vision. Um, you know, if, if you're going to make a lot of line calls or, or you know, uh, I just think it, think it helps. Um, you know, being in two, so you know we've been in two for quite a while. One, one more thing, Mike. Uh, in yeah. terms of the two, uh, when we talk about our pre-snap, what we're specifically, what I'm thinking of is when we're running power, okay, or or we're running jet where we're pulling guys, and they, they, it's easier to see who you're looking for. For me, out of the two, you can take that pre-snap so that when you get around that corner, you know who you're looking for. Versus down on the three, it's a little tough to look. Say you're paying playing an odd front and you're trying to see the backside uh, linebacker that you're pulling for or the front side, you got to look through a center up over. It's a little tougher for me to see that out of the three than the two. All right. Uh, curious as to how much sled work you guys do. So I'm going to start with Skip and we'll work our way back down. Uh, but, you know, do you use the sled and what maybe if you do a, a lot, what's the, the number one drill that you uh, do with it and, and go from there? I, I have not used a sled since I left Lewis in high school. Even got I got away from using it a long time ago. My opinion, again, a simple simple thing: sled doesn't hit back, the sled doesn't move. I think there's other ways you can work on their leg strength and their and their um, uh, and muscular endurance, hitting bags and doing a lot of things like that that they actually have to fit into and grab on, even bodies, uh, as opposed to a sled. So if you're looking for a guy that's going to give you a lot of sled drills, I'm not it. Uh, I won't use a five man. I, I haven't 
five or six years. I think the Crowther sled is my best friend. Um, but yeah, I think I think an old school five man sled does more does more harm than good. Um, so no, I'm, I'm a big Crowther sled guy, but not a regular sled. Coach will do. Yeah, almost none for us as well. So it's been probably probably six seven years since we've been on the sled much at all. Coach Wells. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Bobby. I, I, if, if you have a Crowther sled, that, that is the greatest piece of equipment, uh, I think, for, for offensive line stuff, um, especially on just teaching shoulder skills and kickouts. Bobby, I stole your – I totally stole your kettlebell thing. Uh, <laughs> it is that, – that is the – I've been – I used to tell him it's like hitting him with the wrist watch and nobody wears a watch. And then right. Bobby Johnson says kettlebell swing. And if you ever saw Bobby, he is like a CrossFit athlete. He's probably doing a lot of kettlebell swings. Yeah, um, a lot. So, but, uh, but I, I think that's a great piece of equipment. I only had the Crowther for the time I was at Bowdoin. So, you know, at, at Endicott, I didn't use the sled a whole lot. Um, but then I, I kind of got back into using the, the five-man sled here at, here at, uh, at KO. Just, um, it's almost just like a, a little bit of a warm-up thing. Like you say, Skip, it doesn't hit back, but it, and it doesn't move. But, you know, there's something about, you know, teaching the guys the shock of it. And I got a better drill for that we can talk about if we want to. But, um, you know, I, I just, I was talking with Herb Hand the other day and, you know, he sent me a, a, a drill. They, they do their skip pull stuff and five guys go and they, they hit and they, they drive the five man sled like, like old school. So I guess it's kind of like, what do you want to get out of it? Um, you know, to me, it's not an everyday thing, but we, we use it a little bit more than we used to, but it's for select stuff. And um, it's more just to kind of wake them up a little bit more than anything. Hey, explain to me that kettlebell technique. I remember you talking about it last time, but maybe some of these guys weren't in here. So I guess, Bobby, you want to you want to do it, or you want me to steal your? Th I don't want to steal your thunder. I can I can bring up the film. Um, but uh, Bobby, you want to want to explain it, and I'll, I can actually I got a I got a good picture of the drill. So if you want to explain it, I'll pull the drill. Thank yeah. You. So I mean, I mean, a lot of guys when they think Crowther, they think the chicken wing. Um, so you know, one day I'm just talking to our strength, the strength coach at RPI. And I was like, dude, you know, these guys keep just trying to throw their shoulder into it. And there was a guy in the weight room just doing a kettlebell swing. And I was like, shit, man, it looks like the Crowther. And that's all it is, man. It's just bending your knees. And, I mean, we literally, like here, Coach, Coach Hand did it all the time. All it is is you're just throwing a kettlebell swing. You're keeping that arm locked. And you're naturally you're going to form, a, you know, a shelf or a, or a wing, I guess, if you're doing it properly, if you're spending your knees and you're finishing through like you're doing a, a kettlebell and you have that, that aiming point, you're going to get your wrist and your forearm underneath that defender's pad and you're eventually going to lift them up. Yeah, I, I used to tell them, you know, uh, you always want to strike with the shoulder first and then the wrist. And like, so that was when I used to always yep. say, like, hit them with the wrist watch. And then I tell them, all right, and then as you're driving them, tell time. And that was the lift part of it. You know, so it was like hit them with the wristwatch and then tell time as you're kind of lifting up. But the kettlebell makes so much more sense because that's what kids are seeing today. They see it in the gym. They see it on TV. Um, it makes a ton of sense. That picture speaks a thousand words. And all credit to Bobby Johnson for, uh, for opening that one up to me. Um, Bobby, you're actually – I give you a little credit in the old line manual there on that one. So, but that's, that's what we talk about with kettlebell swing. Awesome. Coach Box, sled work for us? No. <laughs> don't use the sled don't use a heavy bag uh barely use the hand shields um I, I wrestled in high school and in college and, and we talk a lot about that live movement of uh, hand battling and we tend to focus a lot on that you can't hand battle with a shield you can't hand fight with a big bag or a sled uh we talk a lot about leverage and you know working those hands inside so most of our work is like when we do some of our chip drills, I'm looking more for footwork than I am a lot of hand placement. But when we're working our hands, I want it, uh, you know, live as much as possible. So what we do is we'll fit our guys in, we'll fit them in to start, and then we'll, you know, go through our drill. And I insist that our, our D linemen that are working them are slapping hands and pushing hands away. And they're constantly working for that inside leverage. You know, we tell them that old wax on, wax off, you know, thing, working those hands inside. So we focus more on hand placement than a lot of that just, you know, leg drive, leg drive. And I, I want them feeling what it's going to feel like on a Friday night. 
that it's going to be a live person fighting back, not dead weight. Awesome. Pat? Uh, we're the same, uh, all crowther sled. Uh, I don't even think we have a five man out on our practice field. Um, you know, we used it a little bit uh, when I was a GA. Uh, especially, I just don't think you get enough resistance. I think the hand placement's a little different. They get a little wide. And then uh, even some of the smaller sleds we have, if, if our field's slick when we're practicing in the morning, that thing moves. And right. I think it just creates bad habits. Uh, I'd much rather get the get more resistance from a, you know, a human body. Awesome. Um, Dave, you kind of meant you kind of mentioned combo blocking. So I'll start with that. We can work our way, you know, kind of back up when when you guys are coaching up uh, your gap scheme or, or your kind of your, you know, double team, that type of progression at combo block technique. Uh, what are your key uh, key coaching points? Start with that. Uh, yeah, well, so we'll teach our, our gap and our zone combos the same way. It's the same technique. It's just a matter of what scheme it is. Right. Um, nothing really changes uh, for the the man whose gap is covered. Um, it's really for the the uh, backside man in a gap scheme. Uh, so they're going to deliver that lazy – we call it a lazy forearm, just like Coach was saying with the kettlebell swing. Um, and our first step is going to go straight up and down for timing because we're telling the the other man – uh, we're not going to make contact till our second step. So we don't want them gaining any ground on that first step straight up and down and then strike vertical through my foot should land at this of my second step should uh, land at the same time. I'm making contact with that lazy forearm. And then I'm, I'm trying to move that vertical off the ball. Uh, the, the outside man is trying to get to his aim point. We give him to a near number aim point on any gap scheme. So he's going to take a step for depth and width on his initial step and then get vertical through trying to step on the defender's near toe uh, with his outside – with his um, play side foot. And then they're, they're working to get create vertical push off the ball. Uh, the only thing that changes is if we get a really heavy shade almost head up. Uh, we're going to tell that inside man to, to take the whole man. We call it a double stab uh, where he's going to try and overtake it and then the, the outside man's going to uh, knock the hip over and uh, anticipate him climbing. Uh, but that's our footwork. Awesome. Dave? Yeah. Um, we teach we, – we run both gap and zone scheme. It depends on what we're getting for alignment, what we get for maybe a late shift that's going to change from a zone to a gap if we get some, you know, some guys jumping around right before. So one of the things that we do – uh, in order to prepare, we think the toughest block for us to make in a zone scheme is the 3-3 three, three stack uh, with a lot of gaming with the tackles and the backers. And so what we do is I set up a drill like this. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, so I stand behind the tackle and I have a, a look DT and a look linebacker and they're stacked. And what I'll do is I'll match them up with a tight end and we teach them this is how we're going to zone block this. We call it our chip block. And I always ask them right before every play, where is your chip help coming from? They have to point to where their help is coming from, and they step with the opposite foot. So what happens is, is if the tackle pinch or slants out, then it's the tight end's responsibility, and then the tackle is free to work to the backer. And sometimes I'll pinch him, sometimes I'll slant him, sometimes I'll shuffle the backer, sometimes I'll tell the tackle to play tough, and then it becomes a double team. And depending on where the play is being run, if it's being run outside, the tight end has to release. If it's being run inside, then the tackle has to release. So we run that chip drill as hard as it can be, the 3-3 three, three stack over and over a game like crazy. And then if they start giving us shades, then we just tell them, well, they're predetermined who you've got. So we do that. And I don't. I used to do a lot more contact than I did, but guys were getting banged up pretty hard on it. So now I just step back and I just want to see the first three or four steps in the footwork. One of the things we do a lot of times to work on the proper footwork is sometimes you get that scissor step, you know what I'm talking about, where the foot goes back and so they really haven't done anything uh, with their first step. So we put a focus on whichever foot you're stepping with, you put as much weight as you can on your opposite big toe. That'll keep that foot from slipping back at the snap of the ball. And so all I really do when we run that chip drill 
is it's three or four steps. Let me see. Bang, bang, bang. Did you get off on the right guy? Did you get off? You know what I mean? Did it remain a double team and a kiss off? So that's what I do. I just stand behind and I do that. And then I do the same thing with my noses. And I mean, with the center and the guards, the same drill. And I'll even work it with the guards and tackle when we're working back on that 3-3 stack. That's the toughest for us because if they're gaming a lot, you've got to have your good footwork. And that's what the 3-3 is about in high school is to really screw with people with a lot of gaming. So we test at the highest level and we really don't get uh, nearly as much of that as, as you might think. Coach Wells? Yeah, I'm probably, probably exactly the same as Pat, um, except I teach it back, I teach it the other way. So we just see more true three techniques and not wide threes. So, you know, because the guy is going to be pretty heavy on, on our guard most of the time, and just over the years I noticed this, I used to teach it just, just the same way of where we're going to jab with our inside foot, we're going to crotch, you know, crotch with the, uh, with the outside foot and rip our forearm. And I was teaching it, I was teaching it, I was teaching it. And then in the game, they were taking the, they were taking the three on full on the best blocks. Um, I just find that that three technique never seems to go up the field anymore. Um, they, they, they pinch down to the guards most of the time. So I tell my guys the same as Pat. We don't want to gain any ground, um, even, even to the point, Pat, where I'll, I'll even tell them it's like foot fire. They could even get like three quick steps in before they hit that guy because I just want them to set them up. The, the, if we can get both hands on that guy and drive him as hard as we can, we know that, you know, unless you got a total mismatch, that guy's not moving very far. But if you can set him up and open up his hip – so that the tackle or the, the uncovered man can come down and clean them out. That's where, that's where the, the big movement on the block comes. So, you know, in, unless there's an A-gap threat, an immediate A-gap threat, my guard takes the, three, takes the, the covered man on full. And then we, we come in and we use, a, we use a gallop technique or a high leg or a shuffle or whatever your terminology is. And we're going to come in there and, and almost it's like, a, it's like a hip check in hockey. We're going to come in there. And we're going to knock that guy across the face of the guard. So it's almost like, you know, I, I joke around with it. It's like it was like skip back in the old, the old days in the, uh, in the old port. You know, the guy would come out of the bar and they, they'd hit you in the back of the head. They, they cheap shot you with a bottle. It's the same thing. It's like, you know, hitting the guy with a cheap shot and pushing him over to the guard. We, we just would get more movement. We'd get more A-gap, you know, closure so the run-through wasn't going to happen, and our tackle can better transition when the, when the linebacker runs over. So, um, and then I'll, I'll teach it, yeah, if we get a wider guy, how do we handle that? Then we start using our, our, our forearm and, uh, and, and kind of working back off of it. But for the most part, I just believe, like, firing their feet, hitting them with both hands, take them on full, and let the tackle do the – and let the uncovered man do the work. Bert Badu? Yeah, so we end up uh, trying to go more inside gap conscious. So with our covered guys, we see a lot of five front where we're getting a zero on the, on the center and a five head up on the tackle. And the biggest thing that would give us problems with that is the play side linebacker running downhill through the B gap. And so we're asking our tackle to pick that guy up um, on any run throughs because our guard just isn't isn't going to get there with any force and it's going to change the, the entry for the back. So we're going thick with the flipper through the, through the midline on the five shade. And if that linebacker sits, then we'll ask that tackle to try and work back really into the tight ends hip. Um, but they're going to drive that to number two um, backside linebacker. If number one doesn't run downhill. So we end up coaching zone a little bit differently. So those combo blocks, look a little bit different just because of that uh, one issue. Um, but again, trying to, trying to create vertical movement first and then uncovered guy getting horizontal movement is the same approach for us. Coach Johnson? Um, so uh, when I got the Albany, it's been the biggest argument. Pat, I'm like you, I just want to teach, you know, one scheme, I mean, one technique for, you know, both zone and gap. But uh, right now, if it's a gap play, my thing's always been take the, take the verbiage out of it. If I'm covered, I'm Crowther. And we're going to treat a two and a three the same way. If I got a real, real heavy two, my timing step by that guard, he's going to have to take a little bit of a lateral step inside to make sure he gets back on his aiming point. So if you're covered, you're Crowther. And then if you're that off guy, you're that uncovered guy, you're galloping. And uh, one thing, um, like Coach, you said too, uh, Coach Wells, you said too, you know, hey, we're trying to set up the covered guys, trying to set up that, that down lineman. So in our gallop technique, I talk about rocking the baby to sleep. 
So when we're here, you know, we're going gap foot first. So we're going one, two, three. And we're really trying to rock the baby to sleep and throw that guy out of the club. Um, and, and really, we just want to, like you said, open that guy's hip up and make it so we can climb to the second level. Um, Zone-wise right now, it's still the same for the covered guy. We're crowdering. And then um, I, I, I've always heard a lot of people say, hey, lateral climb, lateral climb for the other, uh, uncovered guy on zone. Um, I don't use that just because when, when you say lateral to the guys, their heads get into a passive mode. And, they, and they're like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to take a lateral step. Nope. So we say cover climb, and I'm telling the uncovered guy, he's taking his big toe, and he's trying to step on the, that defender's nuts. That's what he's trying to do, that first step, or first two steps. So at least he's getting up the field and still getting to his aiming point. Um, I used lateral climb for a long time, and guys just kept being really passive as the uh, uncovered guy on the, on the zone double teams. So the last three years, I've used a uh, cover climb. Coach Capone? Yeah, we were, a, we were a, a gap scheme in Portland. We were we run inside uh, versus a three. Again, just like the other guys saying, guard is covered, a covered man up and down with the inside foot. We want to take care of that inside run through. I really emphasize getting, we're going to put two guys at any one particular point on one down guy. We want to knock his butt off the ball, and we're going to stay on that double until there's a threat by the backside linebacker. When in doubt, we're going to stay on the double and again, as long as that guy doesn't run through my play side A gap, he's going to have to run the run the hoop, and we got a shit shot for a good play. And obviously, we get a spark. Obviously, the guy's going to take the guy, the tackle will now climb. I really want to emphasize hips together and knocking that that three shade or a five or a four or five shade if it's a tight tight end and tackle, and we want to get him north and south. And, and let's be honest, if one of our skill kids, if we decide to stay on the double team for that moral victory that it's 15 yards downfield, uh, you know, it's nice for the linemen every once in a while to be 15 yards downfield together and let those little skinny guys make a cut on somebody, for God's sake. Uh, David, I would love that, uh, even if it's just for a four or five yard gain to see that. Team. Yes. I think it just demoralizes that kid. Oh, and yeah. What level you're at. You know, the kid oh. knows how far, he, how far he is downfield. Yeah, yeah, I've been on the other side of those. It sucks. That, that those three shades, and whatever, it was all good. Yeah. It's, it's all about it's like, the radio calls, beat the snot out, and you got to have a little attitude. Yeah. I always like seeing that double team that just puts the, the DT in the lap of the backer. That makes makes me smile when I see it on film. Uh, I'm going to switch it up to outside now. Coach Capone, we'll start with you. Uh, teaching points on the outside zone play. I think, again, I, I, you guys heard my talk. I'm a big footwork guy. First two steps are critical. That first adjustment step, I call it, has got to be off the ball just a little bit. Not necessarily a um, – I, I don't want to use a bucket step. I like to use horizontal splits a little bit, get the guys back off the line if they're not, so that my – so when I take that second step and cross over my inside hands, going outside number to armpit, and I want to talk about running off the goddamn ball. I want to – I just want to come off the ball and I want to run and get fitted in. And if I don't have to use my outside hand, that's great. I'm going to run his ass right to the friggin' sideline. Just keep on going. So really it's those first two steps for me. Open, okay, hips on a 45. I want to stay right on track, and I want to hit with that inside arm. Coach Johnson? Uh, so I'm a big Alex Gibbs wide, uh, wide zone guy, mid zone, so we call mid zone whatever you want, but three step decision. So if you're covered, you're taking a covered step um, and you're just going to take your play side foot and you're stepping on that defender's play side foot. Like coach said, I got to get vertical with my second step, my second step and try and knee him in the nuts. And same thing, my backside hand, I'm, I'm going to turn my thumb out and I'm going to get my elbow point to the ground. I'm going to lock that backside hand on the sternum and I, now I control that defender. And if he keeps fighting me, fighting me, fighting me across my face, great. I'm going to torque him and throw him outside. If not, now I, got, I still got him in a great fit position, and I can throw that, that uh, play side hand on him and, start, you know, and stay in the uh, dry block and fit. Um, if I'm uncovered, um, I stole this from Coach Castonia. They run outside zone for you know, 100,000 years. Um, <laughs> out of Florida State, if you are the uncovered man, you're just stepping to your adjacent lineman's heel. You're going to get some depth. By doing that, you're going to get some depth. And the same thing, that second, that second step, I'm trying to get to that defender's crotch. Um, my aiming point now, he used the word cold nose, and I love it to this day because, you know, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, you go get a glass of water out of the fridge or something, your dog comes up behind you and shoves, your nose right up your, shoves his nose right up your ass. Um, it's the same thing with us. We're trying to get that face um, right into the um, defender's rib cage. 
So we're using a covered step and we're covered. And then we're just using, we're just using that heel step. You know, we call it a drop step, but you just step into that, your um, adjacent lineman's uh, heel just to get some depth and create that aiming point. Awesome, Coach Badu. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm going to tell our guys that I want to drive off the backside leg and try to get my backside hip to the defender's outside hip. We're going to play long with the backside arm, same concept you guys are talking, and then try to try to judge the speed of the linebacker for how wide I need to take after I disengage with the D lineman. So my uncovered guy is going to try to take as thick of a path as he can through the covered defensive lineman. So I want the uncovered guy playing physical to take that reach over. And I want my covered guy playing fast, playing long with the inside hand and then settling in space so that uh, he's trying to just be a wall for a more athletic linebacker. Coach Wells. Yeah, um, I've, I've gone back and forth with this over the years, and we ran a lot of jet sweep when I was first at Endicott, and we were really good at it. Um, and I think what we, we kind of came down to was we want to zone the entire front until we can't. And, and what would happen was you'd get a, you know, a three and a five, let's say, on an open set where the tackles got the five and then the guards got the three. And, um, you know, we're telling the tackle, you know, okay, you're not going to get help now because the guard's covered, so you're solo, and then the guard and the center are going to work together. And we had all these things. And then, you know, when we couldn't do it, when you started getting guys, you know, swinging in on vines and they're, they're shooting in from everywhere, I like the outside play when they're trying to jam up the inside. So uh, we started kind of we, – we, we had calls for all of it. Three men in the zone was a stooge call, and, you know, five men in the zone was a gang call. And – it just ended up being that the gang seemed to be the way that we were getting the best push and kind of using the play side tackle as our point man. So we'll reach the same way that a lot of guys are talking. You know, we're going we're gonna to open with an arc step. And we're going to try to take our backside arm. We're going to try to stab the defender in the throat and keep our outside hand free and use that, that part of his sh shoulder pads as a handle and drive him. You know, as we're working laterally, we're still trying to lean into him and push him down the field. So as long as we have a good guy that can kind of get to the point, I just had everybody else chasing the next lineman's, the next offensive lineman's hip. So instead of, it's kind of like Bobby saying, of trying to get to his hip, you know, uh, to me, I'm not worried really about really what's going on inside as much as I am to get my outside hand onto the, onto the low back of my, of my uh, next lineman. And then it's kind of the one, two, three and work up. And if it stretches and all that other shit, but to me, if we're running outside zone, we're running friggin' outside. We're not running. I don't run mid zone. I, I, I can't figure it out. So that's why I don't run it. I want to run something to the edge. So I'll try to find a way to maybe chip that tackle a little bit. Or if I got a real good tackle that can reach, he can set the point. But for us, we're more like elephants on parade. It's a gang call. Get to the next man. And then anything that tries to bust that gap is your guy. And, you know, again, this is when this is all happening, right? They're all coming. So as long as we can kind of get to our next man and force everything out the backside tackle, then we, have, we think we have a chance to get at the edge with a jet sweep or a toss or a rocket or something like that, something that's going to get us outside now. So it's a little bit different the way that I teach it because our back is not going to bend anything. He is running to circle the defense. So it's a little different. Coach Block? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> this year I started uh, three sophomores. Um, so, and a lot of these kids were two way players and you get them, you know, how it is in high school, you know, group O group D, you know, it, you, you just, you can't spend a ton of time on stuff. So part of my job is to simplify it. And, uh, so one of the things that we teach is any outside plays when you're going, everybody is to reach up to one man. That's our limit. If it's one and a half, then that's on Mike. He's done something wrong with his uh, backs because we're only going one man. We're not going a guy and a half. So we teach everybody on those plays, you go up to one man. And the second thing we teach them is that you do not have the football. Okay. You cannot score a touchdown. Your job is not to get upfield as far as you can find somebody, get upfield one man. And if you have to turn back to hit somebody, but what I hate was guys running into the end zone and never hitting anybody on plays like that. So we tell them, 
one man and you can't score on this play. Get one one guy, and we teach it differently for our tackles and guards versus the no uh, versus the center and the backside guard. We'll slip scoop that uh, with the center and the guard. Will the center will take a crossover step and take an angle of pursuit to where the play side backer is to actually pick up the backside backer. Front side are taking the normal reek step, bucket step, whatever you want to call it. Awesome, Coach. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it sounds like we're pretty similar um, technique-wise to what everyone's talked about already. Uh, as far as coaching points go, um, you know, we teach it as a the aiming point as the inside leg of the, the tight end or ghost tight end if it's to an open side. Um, our best success came after I stopped using the phrase run off the football for whatever reason. Uh, when we used that, it turned it, it led to a lot of drop and crossovers initially. And we were overreaching and running around the block as opposed to going through our aim point. Um, so in this play, we're really looking to create lateral stretch or vertical push. Either one is good. You just can't get stalemated, especially to the front side. Uh, and the thing with our backs on our aiming point is that it's a stagnant aiming point. So over that tight, that tight end aligned, that's where the aim point is. You're not chasing it. So usually our – our best outside zone plays are hitting in the front side or back side A if we're getting the stretch that we want. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that we kind of changed halfway through 2018 and uh, the play became much better for us. Yeah, I, awesome. I'd say half, half. Yeah, I'd say that too, when you're talking about any of, the, any of the plays, right? I think power kind of speaks to a certain mentality, right? ISO speaks to a certain mentality. You say outside zone, it means something different to to Bobby, it means something different to Skip, it means something different to Pat, it means something different to, you know, it means something different to all of us. And so, yeah. you know, it depends on, I think if you're committed to going outside, I'd say, you know, I think Alex is on here, you know, talk to Coach Rotsko. Go If you want to get outside, do whatever you got to do to get outside. Go unbalanced, you know, shift to it, motion to it, find a way to get outside if you want to run outside. That's a different way of kind of thinking about the play than a C-gap zone play that, that is going to cut up. And the best ones are like Pat said, they, they, you know, they'll say, Oh, that's an inside zone play. And every offensive line coach in America goes, no, it's not. Right. You know, we don't um, run a ton of close side outside zone. So we're not looking to capture the edge very much. We're looking to stretch and puncture. Right. And all you, all you want to do is get uh, reach one link in the chain. And if you get, if they get double reach, that's where the ball should go. Yeah. And that's, and that's the difference is that like what I'm talking about is no outside zone means over there. Right. Like, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, I tell them it's an Apache block. What's that, Coach? Circle, circle the wagon. Circle the defense. Get out there and go. You know, because we, we got to hit the edge. And so when, when it started kind of changing that the wide zone was coming into vogue, I got all freaked out because I'm like, that guy's not reaching the end. How, this isn't a, what, what's going on? And so I, I took that play out behind the shed and shot it years ago for me, you know. But that's the difference, I think. When you talk outside zone, you got to start – with the minutia of what is, what are you talking about? Where's the aiming point? Because that dramatically changes how the techniques can be run. I think some of that too depends on what kind of backs you have. You no, know, no if question. you have that, that good, you know, tailback with the vision who can stick his outside foot in the ground and make that cut, then, um, you know, I, I think that stretch, stretch and function, you know. Well, and, and that's, good, like, that's like, I, I used to always say about inside zone, like I think inside zone conceptually is a good play, but it's not for me. Um, like Bobby remembers when I had the kid Mikey Lane at Endicott, you could ask Mike Lane to do anything. You know, I talk about him a lot on this when we're talking up here because he's a main state trooper. But whenever we ran inside zone with Mikey, he was a true inside zone guy in some respects where he could like just great vision. He was never wrong. When he bounced it, he bounced it. When he, when he bent it, he bent it. You know, it was like it was awesome. And then the next kid came in and he wanted to do what Mikey did and he didn't have that ability. So you're absolutely right that everything depends on your personnel, right? So don't, don't try to stick a square peg in a round hole and don't slow down a speeding bullet either. Right. And in, in, in my case with, with our kids that I'm dealing with is, you know, I don't want to put too much pressure on them. You know, I tell them it's up to the backs to make the plays. They're the one going to get the credit. No one's sticking a microphone in your mouth at the end of the game. All I care about is at the end of the play, you've got hands on somebody. Let the back make the cut. I don't care – you know, if you didn't get outside of him, you know, and even though we're running outside zone, you didn't quite reach him totally, even though he was a man outside. If your hands are on him, that's all I care about. The back's job is to make the cut. Right. All right, I'm going to get into some, some past stuff now. And instead of going all the way around the horn, I'm going to kind of hit three guys at a time with, it, with a couple of different questions here. Uh, so, um, 
I'm going to start uh, just on technique with uh, Pat, JD, and, and Bobby. And then after that, I'm going to go to Dave, Skip, and Ben and, and ask you to talk a little bit about uh, the protections that you guys use at the high school level, uh, what's the most successful, um, you know, for you there. So let, let's start with the, just the technique of pass progression, uh, pass protection, the progression that, that you might teach, how you drill it. Uh, Bobby, you want to go first on that? Yeah, um, biggest thing for me is, is feet first. Um, you know, if you – I mean, worst case scenario, if you get a shitty punch, you know, part of my friends a crappy punch or you miss your punch, but if your feet are good and you're in the way and you're on your aiming point, you're fine um, for the most part. So, I mean, for tackles and, and uh, I mean, for everybody up front, our aiming point is the same for our feet. We want to have our knee split in that defender's crotch and I'm trying to stay inside out um, on everything. I teach, I used to take kick all the time, but I've been brainwashed by uh, the Charles Bentley. So now it's a drive or a post set just because I'm a firm believer and, you know, hey, if I'd say drive set, that kid knows now he's got to drive off the inside of his, you know, inside of his inside foot. And if he's got a post, now he knows he has to drive off the inside of that outside foot. Um, but I think feet first. Um, and we just, we'll do a progression where we're just going to – I'll have three cones and I'll have three sets. It'll be an A set, a B set, and a C set. And we're working angles of our sets. And we're working – you know, they're, they're learning their body. Some guys might take two – two drive sets to get to that B cone, whereas a longer kid might take, you know, one and he's at that B cone. Um, so my biggest thing first off in pass pro is just is feet first. Awesome. JB? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with Bobby. You know, I, I, I do think this, though, you know, this is kind of a way to kind of think a little bit differently about it. Um, you know, I, I was, a, I was a, a shot putter and a discus thrower in college, too, and, and I had a great track coach. And his thing was, you know, when we go out on the first day, he'd get the shots of the discs out and he'd say, get in the circle and throw. And then he'd look at it and he'd say, all right, this is what we need to work on. And it was kind of like, it kind of occurred to me that um, sometimes it's, it's, you know, we want to get to, you know, the kids want to get to one-on-one -on -one pass rush and we want to get to one-on-one -on -one pass rush. Like sometimes eh, maybe that's not the worst thing in the world to throw the kid in the fire and, and have them getting in against somebody right away. But I, I agree with Bobby in those first couple of days that you're just teaching things, um, understanding what we're talking about. And, and to me, a, a lot of the things that I talk to my guys about is realizing how far they don't have to go. You know, sometimes a tackle gets there and because he's maybe a heavier kid and he sees a kid that, you know, has, you know, washboard abs or something on his outside shoulder, he thinks that his mind is perceiving that guy to be a lot wider than he needs to be. So I, I spend a lot of time with the guys doing the same thing that, that Bobby's talking about is kind of setting spots and kind of showing them, you don't have to block that guy. You just got to block that spot. And so we work on where to get to on, on our sets. And so it's very much the same thing of kind of throwing those flat cones down and letting them get like a kinesthetic awareness of their feet of how, what does it take for you to get there? Generally, I, I, I try not to tell, overcoach the guys at the beginning. Hmm. If we're going to take two kicks or two drives, you know, we're going to take two. We generally don't, don't talk about the third one until we start to get into reading shoulders and that kind of stuff. But at the high school level, I just want to get the kid to take two good sets on a wide rusher in one good set, one good driver kick on a, on a tightly aligned rusher, um, you know, and, and we kind of work from there. And, and I think that that's like just the basic thing. What we do is we just take their helmets off and I set the helmet down in the technique that I want them at and they adjust to their own helmet. And then we work all the sets off that. So we get in the old grid, set the helmets where we want and we set to those things. Awesome, Pat. Yeah, we spent a lot of time on the initial set. Um, the thing they'll hear me say a thousand times in practice is you always have time for a good pass set, especially the young kids will panic as soon as anyone gets off their body. Uh, so we spent a lot of time getting, taking proper depth and width on that first set based on alignment. And we're going to talk about how you want to set to different techniques. And then uh, again, as we're setting, Bobby, I'm with you. I'm completely converted to the drive catch. It's all we talk about now. Um, we're not, we're not kicking. We're driving off the front foot. We spent a lot of time watching that initial set and that initial push off the front foot. Uh, we talk a lot about the direction and the angle of the toes in that set. Um, toe up in the sky is going to equal weight back. You're not going to be able to redirect. We talk a lot about keeping that whole foot in the ground, keeping that weight on the inside third of your insteps. Uh, so you can, again, functional movement. So I should, as soon as I push off that front foot, that back foot should land and I should stick my instep in the ground, keeping the knee tucked so I can go back in either direction 
uh, if I need to on my second set. And then uh, the only thing that's a little bit different is we're going to say set to the, the near V of the neck, wherever we are, um, covering a little bit more color. You know, with all this time on my hands, been, went down plenty of uh, Twitter wormholes, and that's something I really like from Paul Alexander. You know, outside hand down the middle is death. Um, so we've, re we've I saw it during the season. I've been watching a lot of it this pa these past couple of weeks, so that's something that we're going to stress a lot uh, whenever we get back. The, the other thing, the other thing, Pat, you know, we talk about Paul, um, you know, he talks a lot about um, uh, quiet feet. And I thought that was a really good coaching. Yeah, point. I like that as well. You know, I was with him. I was with him. He, he did like a little clinic up here and, and uh, at one of the high schools and I was able to kind of sneak in on it. And, you know, the quiet feet aspect really kind of said something to me because, you know, we, we, we talk, you know, offensive line coaches talk about boom, boom, boom. He's used loud steps, and a lot of power into the ground, you know, you know, having quiet feet mm -hmm. um, and, and being able to kind of keep your cleats close to the ground and, and, and move efficiently and quickly um, without being over, you know, you, we all have that kid that takes that, you say kick, they take that kick and that, that foot comes way up and it slams into the ground and just totally disjoints them. So quiet feet is another thing I tell the guys, you know, pop, 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 you know, nice and easy. You know, we're not like guys on TV, you know, I don't care if you cameras on. Look like a new guy. I don't know who that is. One of you guys up there is muted. Like Dave Carroll. <laughs> Always a dumbass. <laughs> All right, um, Coach Adu, I'm going to go to you first. I know you guys run a lot of uh, a lot of smash and, and four verts with the quarterback in the pocket. Uh, can you kind of talk about your, you know, like your basic like three step protection? Yeah. So <clears throat> for a long time, we were big on big. Um, so, so much, so much five man front in our league and we've sort of seen a shift to teams really figuring out how to attack us when we're in big on big. Um, so last year we really focused a lot on half man, half slide. Um, just wanted to be very specific with how I communicated the checks out of that. If we do have a five man pressure um, with both defensive ends rushing. Um, cause that last thing I want to do is get our quarterback hit, obviously very important player for us in, in high school. You don't really have a, a one B a QB very often. So, um, half man, half slide was great for us. It lets us get our back in the route. And usually for us, the back is one of our best athletes and featuring him in a route is usually a good matchup for us. Awesome. Uh, coach Bach, our quarterback is, uh, a little bit more of an outside of the pocket guy. You want to talk a little bit about our slide protection? Versus yeah, the I mean, we, we run big on big for straight drop back. Uh, we, we tend to run, uh, we vary it. We'll slide the front side and we will slide and turn back on the back to pick up any trailers, blitzing linebackers, things like that. Uh, so we'll slide the front, including the center. Uh, if you're uncovered and nobody takes your inside gap, then you turn back to pick up any corner blitz, backer blitz so we put that on on uh on alignment to, to help with that as well so we we do a lot of slide protection sometimes depending on what we're getting for fronts or what we're getting for corner pressure uh we may run a little waggle look we'll pull the front side guard out there to help out uh it varies week to week so like i said we run some wing t stuff sometimes and sometimes some you know rollout stuff it depends on on what we're getting but there are times that we've we've even run just straight turn back all the way across and sent the back front side. Depending, you know, turn back, I got that. Gosh, Northeastern used to run it. Uh, we ran it skip when, when I was at Lewiston when we were running triple option, a lot of turn back protection. Uh, so our turn back uh, is, is really a quarter turn and then whoever crosses your face. And we teach this technique to, to uh, we call it ass blocking people. If no one's crossing your face, keep backing up. Keep backing up. You're going to help the guy next to you. Yeah, I, I would add to that, too. Dave mentioned kind of the, the waggle type look. You know, one of the issues that we had with teams that would put five down would be that uh, when we were in a slide protection, our front side tackle sometimes, especially this year with the younger kid, a sophomore, uh, struggled with that, you know, hard rush with that real athletic kid off the edge. Uh, so we ended up just, you know, locking him on the – uh, the tackle right in front of him and, and just kind of pulling the guard around um, and then, you know, sliding the rest of the protection towards that 
pulling guard and using the tailback to, to pick up the backside. Uh, so that, that was a pretty good adjustment for us uh, th this year. Uh, Coach Capone, I'm going to go to, to you next. Um, you know, I know uh, Coach McLeod's got all sorts of things going on uh, uh, over there at Portland. What, what are just, what's probably the best pass protection that you guys use, and, and how do you adjust uh, between the even front and the odd front? I really, I mean, I think I'm a big guy, big uh, three-step guy. So obviously quick protection, slide protection, I, I really like. Uh, we also change it up by going half slide, half man insert in the back. Or if we want to get the back out, we can free release it as well. Uh, the thing that I'm a big, big believer in is moving. And Jason and I have gone back and forth and says, try to get the, have different launch points for the quarterback. So I think being able to have a, a turn back or some kind of a sprint out protection, uh, as you guys have mentioned, some kind of a boot or waggle, where now you still turn it back and you get the backside guard, secure the edge, and then slide. I think all those things, I just think if you're going to drop back and have the guy throw it from the same spot every time, I think from a defense perspective, it's easy to, to dial it up and try to find a way to get put your quarterback on the ground. Awesome, Coach. Uh, I want to get into – to kind of finish up here into a little bit of steam stuff uh, with you guys. Man, if you get a chance, we'll get some guys on for a few more questions at the end. But um, we'll just kind of go around the horn in terms of, uh, you know, I think a lot of teams are going to the, you know, they're seeing a lot, I know we're seeing a lot more odd front defenses, uh, particularly a couple teams going to the tight front this year uh, where they're playing the 3-4 with the, with the four eyes. Uh, your favorite run scheme uh, against the 3-4? and why you like it. I'll start with Pat down at the bottom. Uh, yeah, so we had plenty of experience with it this year. We got it three times uh, with the four eyes between Villanova, Elon, and Colgate. Um, so it really depends on if they're going to stack or they're going to balance up. Um, we've had a lot of success with gap schemes. Those have been our best plays. And whether it's really formationally based where we can establish leverage, um, is it going to be power, counter, or duo? Uh, we, we'll carry all three against these teams. We'll have certain odd adjustments for each, again, based on leverage. And that's something that we, we take a lot of time on during the week. We, we have a lot of extra walkthrough time for the odd, for the odd teams because there, there is a lot more coaching involved um, just because usually we don't see it all that much. We'll, we, we won't see four eyes from our defense, but we got it three times this season. Um, so it's going to be some sort of gap scheme has been the most effective. Um, you know, I, I would say power has been the best. Um, but we had a good amount of success with counter this year as well, both open and closed side. Awesome. Uh, Coach Paul? Basically finding, finding a way to kick the overhang. Yeah, I, I would say with us in our, in our, you know, meetings during the week, we have a, a you know, he says, uh, you know, give me three plays I can run outside, give me three plays I can run C-gap, and give me three plays I can run inside. So my job a lot of times during the week is to, you know, scheme up how am I going to block outside, how am I going to block C-gap, and how am I going to, you know, block inside. And for us, because, you know, we see a lot of our odd fronts are stacked. We don't see a ton of 4-I. I mean, we run it, and it's like I hope nobody else does because it's a good front for a lot of things, especially against wing T teams because of their rules. Um, but so – if you're going to give us angles, we're going, to, we're going to take the angle. So, yes, we're a zone team, but if you're going to give us an angle, we're, we're just going to take the angle and expose the angle. Uh, so that's that's how we determine what we're going to do is if you're going to show us a front, you're going to give us edges, we're going to take those edges. So, And we're going to come up with three plays we, or, and drill them all week long. Now, Mike has a thousand different plays, but for us up front, we always just say, yeah, I know it's a different word, but it's just like this. So we have a lot of plays that are, it's the same thing as this. So, you know, when we see, if you're going to give me a four eye, you're just giving me an angle and I'm going to take that angle. I'm going to expose that. So a lot of counter plays, you know, we'll tackle down and we'll kick out. Awesome. Coach Wells. Yeah, I'm with, I'm with coach Bosch all the way. You know, I think, you know, you present that four eye. We, again, we don't see it a lot. Um, but I look at it like how, you know, um, when I was out at Illinois Wesleyan, uh, we would have to go up against the, the, the old school, like Bear 46, Desert Swarm, you know, these defenses that were just like these, these bastardized defenses that were basically glorified Bear fronts. And, you know, what worked against them works against the 4-I stuff. You know, it's, it's 
first thing I say is put a tight end in the game. If you got odd fronts or odds with four eyes, put a tight end in the game. If you don't have a tight end, find the next lineman um, and, and, and put him in a tight end number if you want. But, but you know, put that guy in there, and it just creates that extra gap, and it creates problems for those fronts. If you're, I'm with Coach. If you're going to give me a way to pin somebody, I'm gonna, I'll pin and pull it, and, and we'll figure out a way to block it. But if we're just going to line up, put a tight end in, let's run power. Um, you know, let's, let's put a tight end in and see what they give you on the backside and see if you get counter. And then, you know, the other thing with the four eyes, cause we ran it at, we ran it a little bit at Bowdoin when I was there. Um, we just, we trap our own four eyes. And I'm like, I, I, I hope that other teams don't know that there's a play called the trap because that can be pretty good against the four eye because all the thing is, is a wide ass three. So yeah. we would slingshot that four eye. Tell them actually, to, actually, literally to jump the four- and smack him in the back and then trap him. I mean, well, I mean, your first step with a four eye is actually towards the tackle, so it just works against you if you want to trap the guy. Right. I mean, your, your well, footwork in a four eye, your first step is towards the tackle, so that trap is just brilliant against that play. And coach, what we would do is we tell the tackle if I was that if I was that right tackle and I got that four eye, we'd tell him to take his hand and almost jump around him and smack him in the back, throw him by and transition to the linebacker. A lot of times our guard was – there was no one to block because he'd throw the defensive tackle to the ground. That's um, beautiful. So when, there's, when there's something new, it's always something old. You know, the old guys in the room will back me up on that. Absolutely. When it's something new, it's always something old. And, you know, old stuff beats old stuff. So don't be afraid to line up and run power at anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. I like it, Coach. Coach Ledoux? Yeah, we run a ton of trap, too. And uh, I think just like you guys are saying, if uh, there's a – a soft C gap. We're gonna we're gonna challenge you there all the time. So there's a four eye. We're gonna go down. Be as physical as we can. Try to run that thing in the C gap. Coach uh, Johnson. Yeah. Um, last year at RPI, we put just you know the wham play in. Uh, Monmouth runs the shit out of it, and um, so doesn't lock. Yeah, like the lock of Juco. Juco. Um, so essentially, inside zone, and then your backside tackle. He's taking a jab step. He's, we call it a hammer step. He's influencing the backside four eye. He's got anything in the C gap. And then the, the H back, wherever you have, tight end, fullback, receiver, whoever it is, they have anything backside B gap. And um, we ran that play probably 50 times last year. Um, we saw the tight front, I think, six weeks um, in our season last year. Um, I mean, whatever whatever's big in FBS two years ago, or, or is now is going to be big in division one double a you know division two division three two years from now and that's just how it goes so yeah that wham play just the backside tackle taking a hammer step and then either the h trapping the four i or the h going up to the backside linebacker um depending on what they do squeeze and scrape or whatnot that was a our, our money play last year i like that that's good uh coach capone what about you Keep it simple, just like JB guys are talking. Walk was saying, I go, I think trap was a great play. We run it at Portland, and, I, and I'm a big unbalanced guy, especially tackle over. Now they, they want to play a four eye to two tackles. But if you can't wash that down and run gap scheme, counter, whatever you want to do, it, you've got a problem in the offensive line. You better find something else. But I think that's a, a two two pretty easy answers. They want to give you those four eyes. Nice. I, I I'm. I'm going to guess. I'm going to throw this out there. I know. I think Coach Roscoe is still on here, and I'm going to see if I remember the wing T terminology correctly, but if you see two four-eyes, Coach, are you going double Texas and out with the guards and folding both tackles inside? Yeah, that, that would be my favorite scheme, no doubt. You got uh, – obviously, the two guards have got great angles, and you got two big tackles on two little linebackers, and whatever kind of action you want to run, jet – you know, rocket, whatever, uh, is going to influence those guys. So, yeah, that's a great scheme. I, I think the, the old I teams used to run that sometimes on sprint draw. So we kind of got that years ago. And it's always been a good scheme for us. Coach I like Wells, that. I'm, I'm looking forward to that wing tee top talk coming up too. <laughs> Coach Wells, you know, you, you said it hit nail on the head. What goes around comes around. Yeah, old stuff. The they found old stuff. Old stuff, stuff. stuff. It's just – Different window dressing and stuff like that, but it's still a lot of the same old things. Hey, um, well, stop calling us old, would you please? Exactly. <laughs> Alex, thank you. Ben, we're old. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I'm slide I, over. I, I know the reason I like you. I don't know what to tell you, Alex. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slide it over yeah. the even front now. You're getting an even front with a, a three and, and either a, a two I or a one on the back side. Um, you know, what, what's the best way you want to attack that defense with your run game? Start with Skip. Well, when I was running triple, we were going to run triple to the one shade forever. Uh, you, you get that right. Let's take about a, a six foot split with our tackle and veer, veer block it and run, run triple forever. Uh, Again, I, I again run to the open B gap. You know things like the dark play. We want to pull either the backside guard or backside tackle on some kind of misdirection. Anything to open up that 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 B gap. And again, I like again try to use utilize uh, you know vertical splits and, and widen that split out a little bit and put that put that linebacker in in, in, a, in a bind. You know, see how it could go, that that would be ways that I would I would attack it. But again, as a triple guy, that's what we we want to look for. We want to find the one shape. The I'll, remember, I'll, I'll just throw this in there because I know I know Dave's going to remember this. Uh, we put the first year I was at Levitt, we ran a lot of just double slot, triple. Um, you know, I'd done some work with John Warren at, at Massabesic, and uh, we played Mountain Valley. They were undefeated. We needed to get in. We needed to beat them just to get into the playoffs. And uh, we literally just came to the line and ran uh, triple to the one shade almost the entire game and just just shredded them. Uh, it was check with me. Yeah, we just yeah come up to the line and the quarterback will call it one way or the other. It's just good stuff. All right, Coach Johnson, on to you, man. Uh, counter tray, you know, old school Redskin. That's my that was my favorite play as a player running against the uh, even front, um, and 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 dart too. If you have the tackles that can pull dart all day against the four down. Awesome, Coach Ledoux. Yeah, we love tackle wrap, so dart whatever you want to call it, um, and then same. Like going counter to the to the shade side as well, um, especially with a tight end or H back, whatever you want to throw in there. So, same thing, find your find your spot and attack that as many ways as you can. Coach Wells, I'm gonna just jump on the bandwagon, right? Dart. Um, that was that's the favorite way to get in there, but I, I've I've kind of gone back to my wing T roots and really I, I like it better as a tackle trap. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, it it solved some problems with the front side uh, blocking because I always felt like on dart, we ran a ton of it at, at Endicott. We put it in as dart, and then it ended up gravitating to tackle trap just because if you have two great tackles, dart's an awesome play. If you have one good tackle, dart's an okay play. But, if you know, I've always felt that I could kind of get a big split out of the place, out of that weak side tackle, get them underneath, and then give that defensive end a thrill with the trap block. And, and I think that, that that allowed us to be pretty multiple, actually, with a very simple play. But that was my favorite thing to go back against that nose was, was, the, uh, was the tackle trap. Awesome. Coach Bach? All right. I'd like to run tight end wing, get the three tech to the tight end wing side, run GT with a backside read, and read that defensive end. Have the wing trail the quarterback. That's way too complicated, Bob. Jesus no, God. it ain't, man. In the oh, quarterback man. Reads it. No, listen. Here, I, you run everything I told taught you, Miller. <laughs> you run GT to the three tech. You bring the wing back underneath. Quarterback makes a read. If the end pinches, right, he pulls it. If he doesn't, it's GT. I like that. You know I like that, Coach. You've been hanging out with me, too, I can tell, because now you've got the backfield stuff. You've been paying attention to what's going on behind you for the I first know. time in a while. <laughs> yeah. Pat, how about you? Uh, du Duo is our number one play. Uh, if we know we're getting a four down front, we're going to find four to five ways to run it uh, every week. Uh, it's been our most successful play. Um, it's something that we need – we find – you know, specifically finding the game plan every week. Uh, it's, it's our bread and butter. Pat, do you, like that? do you like that to go back against the – are you looking for a certain way to place place to run that? You want to run it to the three? You want to run it to the shade? Does it it's, matter it's to you? All, it's all about leverage on the mic. If the mic's in the triangle, you can run it to the three. If he's stacking – if he's in a 30 and he's stacking the three, your leverage isn't great. We're probably going to go to power. Um, or open side or counter back to the other way. Um, but we're going to find a way, whether it's unbalanced, tackle over, uh, FSL, we're going to find a way to get leverage to run the play. Um, I got one more question I, I kind of forgot to, to throw in there. I'm going to throw it in, and then we'll let guys uh, flip on their mics and, 
and uh, ask if you would wrap this thing up. But, uh, we, you know, we talked a lot about pulling and, and trapping, and maybe we can just go uh, around the horn and um, – Maybe I'll go with the with the high school guys on on just footwork on a trap block, and then I'll, I'll go with the the other three guys on the footwork on a power pull. Um, so so Skip, Ben, and, and Dave, why don't you take what are your teaching points when you're teaching alignment how to trap somebody? Skip, we'll start with you. We start with Mike. Yeah, we'll start with you, Skip. <laughs> and obviously, we get that. If I'm left guard and I'm pulling right, I want to make sure I, I drive that right elbow, uh, open my hips into the line of scrimmage. I want to be as tight to the back block as I can by, of the center. I want to go into the line of scrimmage. I never talk about uh, logging the guy. If we're pulling right, we're going to block right. We're going to use that flipper, and we're going to get into the line of scrimmage, and we're going to dig his ass out. If he's really trying to, to, to re reverse shoulder or wrong arm that thing, the log's going to happen on its own. We'll pin him inside. We want to just get inside, be really violent, keep our pad level down, and accelerate through the block. Yeah, we're the same way. I'm not going to talk about logging guys. I think uh, putting that in their head until it happens leaves uh, a little bit of room for them to maybe take that, and that's not what we want to do. I'm going to tell them to run through the center's opposite hip um, and ask the center to get out of the – the path of the pulling guard. So we're trying to hit that thing as tight as we can. Um, and same deal, run right through them, don't stop. Get those first two steps in the ground as fast as you can and keep exploding through that thing. Coach Bach? Yeah, we, we run something called a trap drill. Uh, you know, we see stuff on paper and we think, well, that's how it's gonna be. You know, we get that inside release by the tackle. Then you're just going to pull and kick out. And you draw it out. The problem is the tackles don't always agree with that. They're not just going to sit there. I mean, they're also being coached by D-line coaches. And sometimes they're on a stunt. Sometimes they're pinching. And sometimes they're slanting. That's the way it's going to be in a game. So we do a trap drill where we will line up the DT on our OT. And I'll stand behind him. And I'll line up the front side guard, the center, and the back side guard just so they're not standing around and during the drill doing nothing. They have to work their footwork so that I don't have a bunch of kids standing around anyways. And I'll put a linebacker out there for them to go to. So what I'll do is one time I'll tell the DT to pinch. And if the DT pinches, we have a rule. Anybody crosses your face ever, you take him. That's your man. You don't have to worry about anything. That's been determined because somebody's in your face. And we teach a technique when, when, when the – Tackle pinches when you're trying to inside release. Because we start with our hands up, we teach them pull and push. Your hand is already up when the guy is pinching. Your hands are up here. You pull and push down. So if he crosses your face, you take him. So this is much as a tackle drill as it is for the backside guard learning. When he gets around there, if there's nobody there, it becomes power to him. He runs it just like power. He has to open his hips and turn up field. So if the guy plays it like we say, this is our thing, be an ass kicker of a DT. You know, the tackles that are playing offensive tackle are also our defensive tackles that we're teaching the technique on how to play trap. Close down, square up, you know. So we want to say, you be an ass kicker on this play. That's what we tell the DT. And then what happens is that pulling guard has to make a decision. I can't kick out. This guy's being an ass kicker. So then what he does in that point is that he will then log. We work on hitting that outside shoulder, turning up field, just giving help to that tackle so that he can then take him. And then your job is to kiss off to the play side backer. And then when we're running trap, we also teach that tackle to slant, slant out. And we tell our guy on trap, if the tackle slants out, he's not your guy anymore. He's not going to make the play. You got to, this is high school football. He's 270 pounds. It's the only place you can play in his DT. He's got his hand in the dirt, and he's supposed to slant out, plant, and come back and tackle the kid running A-gap. It's not going to happen. So we tell our kids, if he slants out, you pull on up for the backer and leave him alone. So that's how we work the trap scheme. We drill it over and over and over. The looks you're going to see, it's not the looks you draw up on paper because other guys are coached. And sometimes it is that ass kicking, blow him off the ball. But it's, it's a lot slipperier in the real situation. All right, now I'll go around. Uh, Bobby, we'll start with you and then go JB and, and Pat. And this will be the last question. Um, you're teaching your, your guards or your tackle on the dart play to, 
you know, that power type of pull. What are your, your coaching points on that? So I teach a uh, shuffle pull. So your first three steps are just like, uh, just like the, um, skip pull, you know, but our guys are going to sh shuffle here. I got a video over here. Well, share a screen. Put on freeze the computer. There we go. Do you guys see that? Yeah. Yep. All right. Here we go. So this is a good job by Rick. Just getting depth and staying square. Hmm. Shuffle footwork, you know, for, I mean, skip pull footwork for the first three, and then we're shuffling because I was having a problem with guys, t you know, opening up, not being able to see their numbers anymore. They're losing the linebacker. Like you guys are saying before, hey, they don't know who they're going to be pulling. You know, they can't see who they're pulling for. So the shuffle pull, you get nice and square. You're still getting there. You know, if it's a counter, we're still, if it's GT counter, we're still going to skip pull regular run, you know, crossover run. But if it's power, we're just going to shuffle pull and we give ourselves a good angle on that. Um, I, I did that this year for the first time. I really, really like that. Awesome, Coach Wells. Yeah, I I do I do the same thing as Bobby. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a shuffle guy. Um, just kind of grew into it. But I think the the way that I tell the guys is this: is that if you're pulling your guard and he's pulling on a power and he's going across two gaps, shuffle. If you're pulling a tackle and you're trying to wrap him and he's going three gaps, let him skip and run. Yep. And, and so that, that was the difference that I kind of had between the two um, because I just think the tackle's got a longer way to go. He needs to get on a horse and get there. The guards almost need to slow down because, yeah. you know, otherwise they're going to get to the hole too fast and they're going to want to get up there and go. Um, so that was kind of the two ways. If we're going to wrap pull, if we're going to pull through, um, if you're going to cross two gaps, go ahead and skip shuffle. Um, and then if you're going to, uh, if you're going to go three gaps, we're going to skip and run the, the, the little term that I use for the guys on the, on the skip shuffle though, is when you're going to pull through and you're skipping and shuffling, I tell them skip shuffle and spike. And so the, 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 the spike term is for your outside foot because we're kept you nice and square. Now we don't want you to, you know, cross your feet over and kind of roll the hole. We want you to kind of think, shuffle, spike your outside foot in the ground, and drive that thing vertical right off the double team's, you know, striking a match off the double team to stay square into the hole. Um, you know, and then the angles change. You block the linebacker on the angle he presents himself. But as we drill it, it would be skip, shuffle, spike, get up the field. And that's kind of how we start to drill that. If it's going to be going from another gap away, we work on the skip and run, which is kind of where he's got a little bit more distance in the – the blocks become a little bit more defined and you might have a better track to come through there. So that's how we, the, that's the differences between the skip pull for us. Awesome. Uh, Pat, you want to wrap this up? Yeah. Uh, we, we have one kid that skip pulls. Uh, he's got really good hips where he can clear three gaps on two steps, more or less. Uh, the tackles and the other guard are going to open pull. So we're just trying to get depth off the line on our initial step. Uh, if they step underneath themselves or straight back, they're wrong. They have to drive off the opposite foot and almost get that first step to uh, behind the center's near foot. Uh, they got to make sure they get enough depth to clear the center. And then they're going to cross over run on their second step. They're trying to get to the to the point as soon as they possibly can. Uh, so just some guys just don't, I don't think they have the hips to skip pull. They don't clear it enough and they end up, sh I don't, uh, they end up getting caught behind the line of scrimmage. They're not able to clear the double team. Um, so we're going to just teach them to, to open, open crossover run, and uh, we want to get them to the point of attack as soon as possible. No one skip pulls at Albany. It's all open crossover run. <laughs> that, was, that was my favorite clinic of, of this whole thing, man. <laughs> that was awesome. You guys are, are fantastic. I really appreciate your time. Uh, that was outstanding. Um, you, you guys who are out there, go ahead and, and clip on your cameras. And, and if we got some questions, uh, we, we can try to try to get a few. Coach, ask I get one. Yeah, go ahead, Coach. Coach, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you on duo. What are you teaching that running back with his eyes? Is, it, is he reading the mic the whole way, staying tight, and then 